Welcome to the 6-8 Culture Podcast, an international community where we share stories of transformation and restoration from the inside out, based on justice, kindness, and humility. Come journey with us. I'm your host, Rob McKinley. Welcome back to part two of our interview with Brian McConaughey of Ratanac International. In part one, Brian invited us into his journey in forensic science and the formation of Ratanac. We pick up where he was explaining a sense of night vision, where things aren't always as they seem in the beautiful and re-emerging country of Cambodia. Yeah, that's an incredible way of putting it. Uh, like you're, you've put night vision goggles on to see through the shadows, and that's I guess you just conveyed in words what I was feeling after I read that book by Rexa. Any comment on Angelina Jolie's movie First They Killed oh, My Father? Oh, yeah, it's a good movie. I mean, in some ways, it it doesn't answer a lot of questions in terms of chronology. That can be a three month revolution or a ten year revolution. And I realized that's actually probably delivered in the movie because it's through a child's eyes where she's confused and she doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, uh, Angelina's movie is a, is a very good movie. And I actually have a lot of respect for her. I don't necessarily have tons of respect for a lot of people in Hollywood. I do for her. She's really put her money and her life where her mouth is in terms of caring for people. And there's every indication that's sincere and her reputation in Cambodia is huge. And she really does approach the country with a great deal of sensitivity and compassion. So I very much admire her for that. Mm, Good to hear. With a previous NGO that I was working for, I was involved in advocating for a program called ETIP, Ending Trafficking in Persons in Cambodia. A large focus of this program was on young men. So a a substantial amount of trafficked persons are males that are promised jobs on fishing boats in Thailand. Can you expand on this issue and traffic young men? Yeah, we we focused on uh, the projects we run in Cambodia now. uh, I've I've rescued, you know, hundreds of uh, originally children. We used to do children's programs. Those are now independent. And we work with with young women that have actually sold overseas uh, internationally as product from Cambodia and getting them home and restored. And I knew there was trafficking of males going on, but to be absolutely frank, because I mean, there's no heroism with, with who I am or what I am. I'm still the frail kid from Belfast. Mm -hmm. I avoided male trafficking issues because I didn't want to go there. If you take a young Cambodian woman that has been sold to China as a sex slave and has been raped five, 7,000 times or whatever, and you get her home again, and she's completely a wreck. It's it's going to take a lot of work, and it does take a lot of work to psychologically put them through the trauma counseling, the cognitive, the narrative therapy, the medical intervention, the reintroduction to uh, her family with dignity, job skills. Like it's huge. And as you go through that process, you're dealing with let's say 110 pound small, slight young woman from Southeast Asia. And so even for them, when when you hit the wrong nerve in counseling, they become very angry. I mean, there's a lot of suppressed anger with what's happened there. That's that's all part of the mix. So what happens then if you take a 23-year-old young guy who has been used as a slave, who is muscle-bound, utterly abused, distraught, and you put him in the same counseling session and you hit that raw nerve and the anger management goes out the window. How am I going to protect my staff, my counseling staff with that? How am I, what happens if in anger he runs out and robs a bank while he's in one of our projects and under our care? Who's responsible for that? What happens if he actually rapes, abuses uh, some woman because of anger in his system? Who's responsible for that? How do we deal with that? What happens if he kills? So I, I approach the whole thing with fear, to be honest, because I'm very human and, and I avoided it until I was approached by a journalist from the New York Times who had been given a video from a cell phone and he wanted me to forensically sort of have a look at this and tell him you know if it was real uh, which is obviously what I've done with many videos and it was of four young men who were transient workers in Southeast Asia who were on a fish boat and I knew there was a lot of guys being sold onto fish boats as slaves 
but I'd never witnessed this. And so this video was, was of four young guys that were no longer needed by the crew. And so they threw them over and for sheer entertainment with laughter and frivolity, they were uh, using them for target practice and killing them. Uh, and this video is gut-wrenching because you're watching four young men, absolutely hopeless, bobbing around in the water in the middle of the ocean. Like there's nowhere to swim. There's nowhere for safety. You just swim and duck to try and avoid the bullets, but eventually they'll get you. And they did, and they killed them. And I'm watching this, recognizing it's real and realizing, okay, this is the slavery they've been talking about. And, 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 and again, my compassion at that point outweighed my reservations and my fears. And that's so often where we have to get to in life if we're going to accomplish anything, is our compassion and our drive has to outweigh those limiting fears we have. Yeah. And when I watched that video, I figured, okay, I'm in. I'm in. I don't, I don't know if I've got any skills for this, but we have got to work with men. Nobody can leave these traumatized young men. And so we did a lot of research and we opened our first men's project um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, in fear and trembling. We have not had one issue with violence. They are so stunned after they've escaped that anybody could care less. It is the wow. most incredible experience to see these young lives. We got one recently. Young man, uh, 17 years old, his family lived in poverty. And so he crossed the border to try and get a job and was met by this wonderful Thai person who said, just step in the minivan. I got the perfect job for you. And it's 700 bucks a month and you can send back to your poor family. And so he's 17. He's a kid. So he, he goes for it uh, only to be sold onto a ship. And we get him right after he finally plucks up his courage, even though they're real bad swimmers, but he plucks up his courage and he jumps and swims for his life, gets to the coast and comes into our program. And he's 37 years old. And I'm reading the, the file and I'm kind of going, okay, where's the typo? What's wrong? He, he got trafficked when he was 17 and he's just entered our program after escaping at 37. Where, what, what, where's the misprint here? Right. So I talked to the counseling scout staff to discover that, no, uh, he was 20 years a slave oh, on these beautiful. ships. And uh, psychologically, how do you cope with that? Now, that man through our programs is now not only uh, alive and well, he has a whole new life. Uh, he, his dream was always to have, have a farm. He now runs a cassava and cashew farm in Cambodia. <laughs> through, uh, through our counseling program, or while he was in our counseling program, he met a young, uh, young woman, uh, they married. And so he went right from trauma counseling and anger management right into marriage counseling and anger management. <laughs> um, and those two are thriving. They're learning to be compassionate with one another. He's got his anger management under control and she recently gave birth. And so he has a whole new life. And so on the one hand, this stuff scares the wits out of me. On the other hand, I'm thinking, who's got a better job in the world for me to watch this and witness the complete uh, restructuring and, and, and giving of new life to this guy? So we've got 40 guys in the program right now, and they're, they're all of them, to the best of our knowledge, are thriving. We've had no major failures. Many of them are out of debt. They've got jobs. And we're just doing a lot of counseling and therapy with them. So it is grotesque what's happening in the fishing industry in Southeast Asia, the, particularly the Thai fish boats. The Thai industry is horrible. And I haven't been able to eat any canned shrimp or tuna products uh, out of Thailand since this started, just because I know it's slave product. So too with our dog and cat food, a lot of it's fish products coming out of Southeast Asia. Those are slave products. People are enslaved. And what I very quickly learned in that industry is when they want, uh, let's say, 10 deckhands, they will go and they will buy 11. And as soon as they're out into international waters, they will execute the extra they bought just to make a point and say, everybody do as you're told or you'll be like him, you'll be fish food, literally. And so this is this is across the board, violent uh, slavery, like 300 years ago, piracy. And so we've jumped into that too and have participated with many lives on, on the male side as well in Cambodia, trying to restore these poor people that come from a country that is still trying to find its feet after genocide and war and don't have the resources often to help their own people internationally. Incredible. So Brian, would you say that pretty much guaranteed if you see seafood, any fishing related item coming in from Thailand in all likelihood, it's as a result of slave labor. I don't want to say that every vessel and every factory and every processing plant in the Thai industry is is criminal. That, that would be inappropriate for me to say. I'm sure there's good people in there, but as an industry, industry-wide, it is so tainted by massive slavery. That industry, I do not believe, can, can survive without 
unpaid slave labor on those ships. Okay. And uh, the EU has put sanctions on Thailand and they're trying to get them to reform. And the Thai government have expressed their desire to reform. But too little, too late right now. I haven't seen the fact that this has been stamped out. And this is not to just single out of Thailand. I mean, we've got Indonesia and Vietnam. And I mean, they're they're all at it. I mean, the amount of human traffickings we get out of China uh, trumps everything. That's not males because one child policy and gender preference. China is currently 3.5, uh, sorry, 35 million female short. That's virtually the, the population of Canada. Well, there's a recipe for massive human trafficking. And so they are buying up every vulnerable young woman they can find in Southeast Asia, Cambodia being central to that, and shipping them off to abuse and trying to get them out. So we're having girls calling us, young women and girls calling us from China who have been enslaved and entrapped and locked up and are being abused either being sold actively or just used for labor with the odd, you know, sexual assault thrown in, uh, but brutalized. And they are jumping out windows, they are uh, swimming through sewers, they are jumping out of moving vehicles. Their escapes are all movies. So when we get them, they're, they're shattered people, but we have managed to negotiate. Uh, we've been invited into the process with the Cambodian government to participate in the negotiation with other countries as subject matter experts now. And so we have bilateral agreements with China, with Malaysia, whatever, to get these young people back home into rehabilitation because all their passports are destroyed by the traffickers. So how do you get a young person like that home? So we now have the we now have a legal framework to do that, which has been really exciting to participate in that. And again, that wasn't planned by us. I mean, none of us are trained negotiators or lawyers, but the Cambodian government have grown to trust us. And so we've been privileged by them to participate in this and see uh, hundreds of young lives returning now. Um, mm -hmm. That's exciting. That's incredible. I remember a, a number of years ago when I was up in the Kampong Chenang area, I saw truckloads after truckloads of women. So to get a visual, it's like sardines just jammed into the backs of these flat deck trucks heading to the textile factories. And when I first saw this, I was beyond startled to say the least. And from what I understand, with international pressure, they're now paid marginally more than previously, but still work for horrendous pay and very long hours in extremely uncomfortable circumstances. Now, the same goes with the men in the brick factories and some women in the brick factories as well. So as a result of this, many Cambodian men and women are lured over to Thailand on the promise of jobs in the fishing industry or in nannies, either on their own volition or else duped into doing so, which also leaves their children extremely vulnerable to predators. And often the grandparents will be watching the kids or the kids have no one watching them and school is only half day in Cambodia. Is there anything that people can know about how Ratnak is combating this particular situation? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the first thing I want to say here, actually, as I listen to you ask that question and as I think over my previous answers is that it's really important that listeners are aware of the fact there's hope in all of this because it's so easy to just kind of give up and say this is overwhelming sure and if that was the case I wouldn't be doing this for 30 years while the context is awful there is the prospect of very real joy and freedom and restoration but we've got to work hard and we've got to we've got to work long in terms of, of developing that so the, the the structures of a country like Cambodia based on genocide and civil war have been shattered and so you have an economy that is very, very fragile, where the expertise were originally all wiped out. And there's a new generation coming up of young people, very bright, who are becoming educated and are rebuilding their country. And we're proud to have the vast majority of our RANAC staff being young people in Cambodia who are taking the world by storm. I mean, they're change out there to change the world. It's so exciting to see and transform lives in the, in the process of doing this. The, the factories in, in Cambodia, I think, are doing their best to reform, at least the Cambodian government, I think, is imposing some minimum wage. Uh, I think it's uh, $120 a month now uh, mm -hmm. the young women are supposed to get. It's subsistence living at best. There's all kinds of issues. And, and so often the factories, because of the abusive circumstances, are gateways into the KTV, karaoke bars, strip clubs, whatever. That's the gateway into prostitution, abuse, and trafficking. Right. So we have programs that sort of are on the fringes of those factory, that, that sort of clientele, that group of people in society who are so vulnerable in the factories. And so many of these young women, they just want a chance. They just want some kind of a chance. And, and so if given just the slight chance, 
they'll run with it. They're generally very brave, very tenacious, incredibly hardworking. They've had hard lives. And so it's a joy to be able to give them the tools to move ahead. So there's opportunities. We do see reform. Uh, Cambodia is a different country to where it was 30 years ago when I arrived. There's still lots of problems, but there's reforms happening. There's, I mean, a, a pedophile who abuses a child in Cambodia now will be sentenced probably for a longer sentence in Cambodia to jail than they will in Canada. Uh, whereas before, they couldn't care less. It never even happened. It was a free-for-all for pedophiles. So, the, so we've seen tremendous change and tremendous development there going on. Uh, so in that way, it's, it's really exciting. But there's still so much work to be done with a young population, a very, very young population. Because of the genocide, the demographics are wacko. I mean, all the, all the normal graph charts for population are, are wrong for Cambodia because I forget what the stats are now, but it's, uh, I think it's 70% of the population is is under 35 and 25 percent or I, I forget the stats now but it's young 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 which is a great workforce on the one hand but a great source or a great place to go if you're going to exploit people so both the good and the bad coexist in our sure. jobs to try and tip the scales to the good and it's it's possible and so we're seeing we're seeing tremendous development. So I'm really encouraged, uh, and I would encourage people if they are interested in Cambodia or interested in human trafficking issues, which can also be overwhelming, or any of those big issues of the world, right down to the environment. If you get stuck in, don't presume that you can't do anything, but don't presume that it's going to be a quick fix. Uh, we, we like instant results in North America. When we're changing the big questions uh, in the world, it's not a quick fix. It's going to be long-term commitment. But oftentimes, if we stick with it, we'll see rewards. You had touched on the KTV bars a few years back. I went with a local Cambodian NGO called Precious Women and visited a beer garden with their president and founder, Salida. And it was eye-opening to say the least. I have a 20-year-old daughter and just walking in there, and I was the Western male. I was with some female counterparts that had come with us and Salida was heading this and I was there as an observer to see it and the subversive way in which she made connections and is turning the lives around for some of these girls there was, it was really tough to see, but incredible work that she's doing. Is Radnak involved in that, the frontline thing? Is it more post-traumatic? Where are you in that particular type of thing with the direct abuse with these girls that are coming in from the countryside into these KTV bars and beer gardens? Well, you're, you're making me laugh as you describe Salida because uh, she's actually one of the organizations we partner with and Ratnak International funds funds them. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things we want to do as well as developing our own programs is we want to fund small indigenous organizations that just need a leg up. They just need that support to mature administratively and get good at what they do. So that's what we're doing with, with Precious Women. And so I too have been out to those bars and karaoke clubs with them and just with with their female staff obviously present and doing the introductions to sit with some of these young women and talk about their lives and their trauma yeah. and their hopes and dreams for their children and the degree of abuse etc and you're right it is absolutely heartbreaking and you walk away from an evening like that just ready to scream and just kind of go we, we got to pull them out uh, and, and yet so often you it's inappropriate to just go in and pull out a young woman because uh, she she may not even understand enough to, to know that that she's being pulled out to freedom. It'll terrify her. Right. Uh, and if you pull her out uh, sort of very artificially, she will be replaced instantly. And so, so it really is systemic where you work with a local organization like Precious Women and you actually nurture those lives within the karaoke bars and you gradually befriend them and teach them. And that's what they do a great job of. And then they come to some classes on their very, very few hours off. They'll come and they'll learn some English. They'll learn some business skills. They'll learn, and you're just empowering them to move on, to move up, to move out of that industry, which is a far more healthy way of doing it. So it's a slower process. In so many ways, it's a, it's a more challenging process, but it's a long-term change is only going to happen through process like that. So yeah, even there, I see hope. And I mean, certainly I am privileged having been at this long enough that there are uh, young women, there are uh, some of them who were rescued when they were, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, that are now young women that are married, that have their own kids, that are on career people. Um, 
I can go out and have dinner with any number of them. I, again, just for the record, I always do that with staff present. I, I never visit with any of these young women personally for the sake of their reputation and mine, just in case anything would be misconstrued cross culturally right. otherwise. But we go out to dinner and and you just sit and chat with these wonderfully accomplished young women who are university grads, who, who whose life is one I sat with a while ago, and she was sold by her stepmom for 200 bucks for abuse. And uh, it, it took years to rehabilitate her. And now she was the uh, the top IT grad from University of Phnom Penh a few years ago. <laughs> and, and as another one, uh, I know uh, very well that some of these girls are like daughters to me. And she is uh, now a counselor and uh, she's a gr- she graduated in sociology. And she's now a counselor working with another NGO, helping children that have been rescued from the brothels. And so these completely distraught little kids come in that are shattered. And she sits them down in a chair and says, you know, 12 years ago, I was sitting in that chair. And I now have my own apartment. I have my own motorcycle to get to work. I have my own career. I'm a university grad. I have pride. I have dignity. I am who I am. And you too can can experience that. that Your life is not over. I mean, what what a thrill to see not only individual young lives from tremendous slavery and torment in the sex trade being rescued, but now being the solution for others. It's, it's a really exciting process. It, it is. <laughs> and just hearing you talk about this, you we've been talking about some very, very dark things. And mm-hmm. the, the redemptive aspect of it that you're touching on right now makes everything worth it, doesn't it? It's, it's something that, that, that for me, really, this industry, trying to work in this field, will eat you up and spit you out very quickly, as I think it does with many police officers who get to do the investigation, but they don't get to do the follow-up. Now that I'm out of the RCMP and I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to work for these young lives, both male and female, full-time, I get to see the follow-up, I get to see the results of counseling, I get to see new lives who, who are absolutely different from what they were before, who wouldn't have believed they would ever have their own families. Uh, that they would ever have their own property, that they'd be out of debt, that they would have dignity. And I mean, the key word for me in this is, is dignity, that they know who they are and they're proud of it. And it's a really, really exciting process that does put fuel back in the tank because a lot of what we deal with is really dark stuff. It's really corrosive. When you, uh, as I have done many times, watch child sex assault videos, those aren't the kind of things you you forget, they are burnt into your mind. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a counterpoint where you can kind of keep going saying, well, yeah, but look at this example, look at how we have transformed this circumstance to allow this person to rebuild their life in it in a way that is just such dignity and joy in it. So it's exciting. And so for all of those big issues, from a position of weakness, largely for me, and inexperience, and I'm not trained in so much of this stuff, but having the passion to just keep going and learn what I need to learn and not give up. We've seen thousands of lives transformed, which is really exciting. It really is. And also hearing the collaborative part, that collaborative piece that Radnack has with other NGOs, especially NGOs within Cambodia, such as Precious Women. And I've seen the power of collaboration of NGOs working within that country is is so, so powerful. So on that line with Ratnak, what would be the biggest hurdle that Ratnak International is currently facing and how can people best support you in overcoming it? Mm. I think the biggest hurdle right now is COVID-19, just in terms of instability. It is. It creates massive instability, particularly on an economic level on this side, on the North American side, uh, because obviously our, our funds are raised. We're a charity and, and we, we run on donations. We take no government funding. Everything is private. It's very grassroots. People know what we're doing and are aware of what we're doing and choose to donate. But when jobs start to get lost in Canada, that becomes precarious for people to donate. And so when you are when you get a young shattered life that, that has been abused for X number of years and, and has been, we've managed to return them back to Cambodia and they're in our center. And you basically make a promise that, you know, we're, we're going to, it's going to take two years to basically put your life together again and get you job skills training and get you through trauma therapy and all that kind of stuff. My very worst fear is to make promises to a young woman like that. And then halfway through the program, basically say, we're out of money, we kick you out on the street. Mm -hmm. And then we join the line, the long line of people that have lied to her. Uh, Because everybody's lied to her and manipulated her, the perfect job, all all those stuff she's been told. And I want to be the different one. I want to be the one that when we say something, we do it. And so my biggest fear is loss of that stability because we make commitments to these young lives for two years. 
and we need to be there in two years. And then COVID comes along and you're looking at, can you do any financial projections more than six months right now? Probably not, at least not accurately. And so that's been one of the biggest challenges for us is how do we manage long-term restorative programs for really damaged lives when we're not sure what the economy is going to do? So to be completely crass, and I know it's a typical director of a charity's answer, but stable funding is is our biggest need right now. Um, right. And so I used to just speak in many locations and, and people would donate. And now I'm really pushing monthly sponsorship where we can't because of security and privacy reasons, reasons have a sponsorship of a child where you get a postcard and a picture or whatever else. We can't do that with young women and men based on the horrible things they've experienced and their privacy and right. dignity. But what we can do is, is is have people jump in and say, for whatever amount, I'll jump in for 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month. That is absolute gold for us right now because I know that's coming in. And so I know how many promises I can make to how many people basically in terms of these young lives. And we know what we can do. Everything's volatile right now. So stability is everything. And that really does come from what for us right now is becoming monthly donations. Very well put. And and I always say that if I'm acting on behalf of an NGO, no amount is too small and no amount is too great. Even a teenager pushing a, a lawnmower a couple of times a month can afford $10 a month. So all of those small droplets definitely add up. When I speak in, uh, in high schools, my unit of currency is lattes. And I'll say, this is X number <laughs> of lattes per month. And kids get that because it's nothing to them. They just go and buy a latte. It's no big deal. We're wealthy here. Even if we don't have tons of money, we got we got enough money. And so I would agree with you totally that young people, the time to jump in and learn to become part of the solution, learn that, that even as a young person, you can have an impact on the front lines of human trafficking. That's exhilarating. So we always are trying to push young people into realizing you have a voice and yes even financially you can help it doesn't take a lot particularly in the developing world it doesn't take a lot of cash compared to here to restore lives that's right and now that you've shared some of these stories people have a little bit more of a tangible mm -hmm. vision of what they can grasp onto no matter what they support you with there's a shop on the Ratnack website. On ratnack.org, you can go in there and there's a shop. There are a lot of options also within the psychosocial realms, which are really desperately needed for a country under such huge amounts of PTSD. Are there a few things within that shop that you can highlight that people might be able to support? There, there's one and it's a big one, but I think people often gravitate towards it because it's so tangible. There's many smaller items, as you can imagine, but the one that excites people most is basically the return. It's the air ticket. So take a, a young, let's say, 18-year-old young woman who's promised a nanny's job to help her poor family and her young siblings because they can't afford to even send them to school or feed them properly. So she, in fear and trembling, takes this job in China to be a nanny, only to discover that she's been sold into some kind of a brothel network or some kind of abusive, uh, quote, what, what they call forced marriage, which is, I hate to even use the word marriage in that context. It's just brutality. Yeah. And so she gets on the phone and she said, this is what's happened to me. I'm being raped. I'm being abused. I don't even know where I am. They took my passport. They burnt it. And how do we, can you get me out of here? I mean, how do you even deal with a phone call like that? It's overwhelming. And we now have the legal framework, as I've mentioned. And so if she can get to an embassy and, and, and that happens frequently, they know how to get to an embassy or can figure that out. We can get them out now. It takes approximately a thousand dollars to get a young woman out, get her airline ticket, uh, get the documentation done, their temporary travel documents, get her out of China, get her back to Cambodia and in through initial assessment with our team so that she's loved and cared for and safe for the first time probably in years and actually has food and has clothing. I mean, when we welcome them in at our center, one of the first things we give the young women is underwear. They don't even have underwear, a lot of them, because they're slaves. Who would, who would spend money on, on underwear when you're a slave? So. I mean, the, the loss of dignity is profound. Most people kind of when they think it takes a thousand dollars to actually free a real live slave. Yeah, we can do it. It's a thousand dollars. Now, many people don't have a thousand dollars to dump, but many people as a group can do that. Church groups do that all the time. Youth groups do that. Schools can do that. I got a, a bunch of schools who raise money and they don't raise money in terms of dollar figures. They raise money. How many girls are we going to get out of China? Girls just like us, late teens. And how many are like us are we going to get out to freedom and hope? So that's the one that I think excites most people. And we have a lot of that happening where people talk as family groups too before Christmas and say, okay, as an extended family or a nuclear family, we're going to get one young woman out of China to safety and to hope. 
And really, when you compare it with social services in North America and international travel and whatever else, $1,000 is nothing. That's probably the most exciting and dramatic one because with that amount of money, you can participate in a movie. It's like a life that's gotten out. Whether it's through the sewers or swimming rivers or jumping out of windows, we get one out for that. So that's a really exciting process for people, I think, to have a sense of participating and accomplishing that. Mm, that's fantastic. Again, that can be found on ratanak.org, R-A-T-A-N-A-K.org under the shop section. Brian, as we've been talking, I've been thinking of this one proverb that has been continuing to come to my mind. Just looked it up again. Proverbs 31, 8 to 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. That is just a call to every human heart. For those of us who have been given and who have the means to defend those, we are called to do that regardless of your worldview, belief system, gender, ethnicity. And you've been doing that so admirably. Very much an inspiration to me, Brian, and I'm sure to so many other people. Do you have any parting words that you would like to leave? Uh, No other than to say that whatever problems your listeners are faced with, whether they're personal problems or they're the bigger problems of the world that they look out at, don't presume you don't have a voice. There are ways of engaging, but it requires determination. And our society and the entertainment world and the world of video games, etc., teaches us to be instant in terms of our gratification, our desire that, and to be fairly frivolous when in actual fact we can be people of change. And it actually doesn't take a lot of skill. It takes heart. Heart is far more important because normally people that have the expertise will recognize the heart and will come alongside if you need expertise in whatever issue you deal with. So I would just encourage people not to sit back and look at the world, the very broken world, even in a North American context as we watch the news now. My goodness, it's a mess when we watch the news. It's easy to to sort of sit back and say, I just want to recoil from all of this. And my encouragement would be to engage. There's there's one Bible verse in uh, Zephaniah 3, my favorite book in the Bible, where it says, do not let your hands hang limp. I love that little phrase because it's not a request. It's a demand. Do not let your hands hang limp. We've got stuff to do. Shockingly, we're capable of doing it. And if you have a passport, if you live in a democracy like Canada, you have power to speak to those who are elected officials. Yes, you can speak to them. Our democracy still functions, believe it or not. You have a degree of affluence, even if you're not wealthy at all, to help others and be kind to others around you. We have the freedom to be those change makers, and I would encourage people to do that. Such an inspiration, Brian. Really appreciate this time. With you. Thank you. It's been fun. We've been hearing from Brian McConaughey of Ratanak International. If you want to know more about their life-changing work or support them in a journey home or any other ways, you can visit them at ratanak.org. That's R-A-T-A-N-A-K dot org. This is Rob McKinley signing out for 6-8 Culture.